I don't want. <laughs> there is a long. Yes. Okay. Uh, not there. No, no, no. Okay. So you cannot escape. <laughs> um, there is a long time motivation for the calculations we will show today. They, in my case, they ran as long as 20 years ago when I was in Japan working with Professor Nishihara and starting to study the Richmer Meshkov instability. Um, I will speak about vorticity, which is an important quantity in these flows generated by corrugated shocks. They will always appear, and they, will more they are more important as higher is the compression level of the fluid. There are some works quite old, right now, 30 or 20 years ago, or even more, about Mayron and Safman and by Michaelian in the United States, in which they calculated or compute the kinetic energy in the compressed fluid after the corrugated shocks separated from the surface, but with two fluids. This is a very difficult problem. With two fluids, uh, we have two shocks, and then, or a rarefaction here, and then this complicates the calculations. By the way, all our results will be analytical. So I will be restricted uh, only to linear theory calculations, so that the results, so that the calculations can be kept analytical and written by hand, even if they take several pages long. <clears throat> These works of uh, Safman Mayron and Michaelian, actually, they are now a bit outdated in the sense that they did not consider compressibility of the fluids. Vorticity is one of the consequences of, the, of taking into account the, the compressibility of the fluid in the whole time perturbation history. So they used impulsive model. I will not deal here, because we have not started yet, with two fluids, but only with one fluid flows. Single shock moving into an homogeneous uh, fluid, the shock is corrugated, and this is what is called uh, Rizmar Meshkov like flows. I will set the notation and the steps, how to say, the, um, the notation and the physical minimum basis to understand the development of the calculations that follow later. So if we consider a ripple piston, whichever piston it is, rigid or free surface or uh, ablation surface, if it is corrugated, the shock will be corrugated. It will generate pressure waves, vorticity, entropy spots. And the field itself will be strongly influenced by the, by the boundary conditions at the piston and interaction between piston and shock. I must recall here that this is not necessary at all. But the pressure perturbations emitted by the shock waves here are not running waves. At least they are running along the shock surface, but not into the bulk, so they are pressure evanescent waves. This is something tricky, and sometimes it is forgotten, and the abuse of language may give to contradictions. Just very simple scenario. So we consider a ripple shock wave. In front of it, the fluid is homogeneous. Behind it creates perturbations in density, velocity, pressure. We define the shock Mach numbers upstream and downstream. Sorry. Even though I teach every week, uh, uh, my mouth tends to get dry as I speak, then I need some water. A very important parameter in these flows is the slope of the ranking Huguenot at the final state. So the larger is alpha, so the nearer to 90 degrees. So the larger will be the perturbations in uh, after uh, vorticity. So this is something to be taken into account. And I define here this quantity. This quantity will be very important for the later discussion. It is the time at which the shock arrives to position x. Beta is, is the shock speed. I use the letter beta because it looks nice. And simply, that's all. The, the, the usual approach is writing the fluid perturbations, uh, the, the fluid equations, perturbing them, obtaining here the wave equation, Laplacian pressure equal to, well, to the second derivative of pressure. And for the sake of uh, simplicity and that everyone can understand my language, so I just comment 
that this is the scalings of the adimensionalizations, of the normalizations of the different quantities. So the fluid equations transform in this, and the wave equation transforms into this. Along the history, well, several ways of dealing with this analytically. Fraley was probably the first one to deal with this and solve this equation with Laplace transforms in Cartesian coordinates. But even though that's quite interesting, the system of equations that results at the end is really horrible and very difficult to understand the algebra, or, or at least to follow it. However, there is a very nice reference here of the 1960s in which these people used this variable change, kind of imaginary polar coordinate transformation, if you like to call it like that, in which this is the relation between Cartesian and the new coordinate. In these new coordinates, the wave equation is separable. So the wave equation splits into these two quantities, into these two equations, the solutions of which are this infinite series written here. These infinite series are uh, very nice to handle analytically. And they are represented by some coefficients here with the index two and Bessel functions, ordinary Bessel functions of uh, order nu here and here. H is just uh, a pressure gradient, so it's the derivatives of the pressure along the normal direction. If we go back to Cartesian coordinates and try to write the pressure perturbations in the whole space between shock and piston surface, this will look like this. This combination of time and normal position, and here again we have yes, this uh, invariant quantity, the, how to say, the interval, so to say. A natural question is, and this is uh, not trivial to answer, how can we integrate this analytically to obtain information on the velocity fields at any time and at any position in space. So this is actually difficult if we do it by brute force, just asking Mathematica to integrate it in time, and it will take a lot of time and it will collapse, <laughs> and then that's not the way. Uh, what we have found is that there is an extremely beautiful theorem called Graf's theorem. It's a kind of addition theorem for Bessel functions in which each, this expression here, can be rewritten as an infinite series. This is, some people may think, what is nice in this change? <laughs> Actually, there is a lot of information we can extract from this transformation. If we substitute these equivalences here and here into here, we can integrate the equations very easily in time and very easily in space and get information on vorticity, kinetic energy production, and follow the profiles of the perturbations as run goes from zero to infinity. Um, this graph theorem is already very well studied. Of course, it is written uh, in, the, in Watson's book, a classical treatise on the theory of Bessel functions. And if we continue, I, I arrive here to an important point, because this created a lot of confusion <laughs> in the last 20 years, at least discussing with other people, and still is um, creating problems. So, for example, I, I will not show here how we get this expression, but this is the tangential velocity at position x and time tau. It's not at the shock, not at the piston, it's at any position in the middle, at any arbitrary time, greater than tau zero. It is composed of two terms. This is the initial velocity deposited at that point by the shock. Then the shock goes far away and radiates pressure waves. These pressure waves create accelerations and negative accelerations and compress and rarefact the fluid particle, so giving rise to uh, delta dy. So this is the increment in velocity starting from this. This quantity here, if we plot it in space, vy and vx, the initial velocities created by the shock at different positions in the in, in downstream, this field is rotational. All the vorticity is contained here. And this is the action of the pressure waves. So this is irrotational, absolutely. But it has an asymptotic in time, which adds to this velocity here. So this is important. And not so easy to, 
distinguish clearly uh, which effect comes from which zone. After proceeding, this is very brief. Vorticity is generated because of shock curvature. Baroclinic effect has nothing to do here. So this is my conviction. Of course, this is open to discussion. So why vorticity is generated? Because sim simply tangential velocity must be conserved across. And then with a velocity d in front of the shock and d minus u behind, the projections are not enough. And then the particles suffer a kind of twist when crossing the shock. And this gives them vorticity and additional tangential velocity. And this is all. Uh, this effect was um, studied in this year by Keblahan, and he extended it to nonlinear cases. So the paper is actually difficult to read, but it is more general than the results shown here. Just uh, very briefly, we need to speak in the complex plane language. So we need to pass from the real-time domain to the domain of the Laplace transforms in order to get useful information. This is just, uh, how to say, how calculations go. Uh, I start with the isolated shock boundary condition, because it is the simplest and allows us to extract how to do the calculations for more complicated situations with true fluids or with rigid pistons or free surfaces. Uh, I want just to mention, I will not delve into the details of this here because it, is, uh, it will be very long. It will take more than half an hour. This is the exact pressure, uh, Laplace pressure transform for the shock perturbations in the case of an isolated shock. It is just this simple term. It has singularities here at S equal to plus minus I in the complex plane. They give rise to the decay like T2 minus three halves so this, this, this term is responsible for that behavior in ideal gases. And if we see here, we have here these coefficients. If we want to plot any graph, if we want to compare with experiments, if we want to do any calculations, we must have these coefficients pi to n plus one that accompany the vessel functions here. So for this, we must go to the boundary conditions at the shock front, at the piston surface if it exists, etc. and we have found over the years four ways. Three of them are widely known. One of them was a surprise for us because these coefficients can be written in finite terms. There are no needs of recurrences to solve for from P1 to P infinity. So, so it is this expression here, this just uh, to mention. And the last method is if we are working with Laplace transform, to get information in the real-time domain, we need the inverse Laplace transform. This is nothing that is so uh, terrible. It's just that you get used to it and uh, well, provide the integration contour, take account of the branch points, which are the, the only singularities here. And this is a, an extremely nice and an extremely useful result for any analytical calculation that we will do later. The pressure, instead of writing it as an infinite series, can be written as this integral. Uh, this variable R here is here. So it is integrated in the interval from 0 to 1, where Fp is this function here. This function has no singularities for ideal gases. And then a spontaneous acoustic emission is excluded from the problem. It would be very interesting if uh, it happened. But fortunately, not to complicate things, this phenomenon does not occur. Mm. A, sol a typical solution of the equations that I have been showing up to now is this is the shock pressure perturbation here as a function of the distance traveled by the shock in units of lambda. This is more convenient than, than k. I hate kx in the, in the legends. This is, uh, gives, more, give me, gives me directly. Here is the shock was here at one wavelength distance from the point it started to move. What we show here is just the vorticity contour left by the corrugated shock. I will not explain the equations because they are simple, but uh, we have not enough time. And the main motivation of this talk is to determine the geometrical size of these spots. These spots not only contain vorticity, but also entropy. So they are like patches of temperature 
or entropy, if you want, around which the fluid is revolving. The, the size is obviously here clearly seen in numbers. So 0.25 or so for this blue vortex here in the horizontal direction, and one in the vertical direction is trivial. So the, um, if we pay attention, this line here, well, my hand trembles a little, so will coincide neatly with the first zero of the pressure perturbation function. Then, if we know how to write the pressure perturbation function analytically in time, we could hopefully extract the zeros analytically too. And this is what uh, I will show next. The former representations of the pressure functions are not the, the unique. It can be represented as a, an infinite productoria of this form, where this here, Rj, are just the zeros that I showed it before, x1, x2, x3, x4. This, is, this behavior is typical of Bessel functions and also of trigonometric functions. If you look into Rejic and Gradstein book and uh, Abramovitz, Stegun, etc., you will find this is standard knowledge. Uh, the point is that to extract information on the roots of the pressure, we need the initial derivatives, the infinite in initial derivatives of the shock perturbation. This is not a difficult task. And uh, the method we used was already developed by Leonard Euler in the 18th century. So it, uh, this person, were, we are very grateful to him that he existed. <laughs> Otherwise, I cannot promise I would have arrived to this. So this is the algebra, the inherent algebra, and I am afraid of the time, so I will not explain here, but uh, this R1 is the first root of the pressure perturbation, and it is inside a nested chain of intervals. So if we increase the index k, we will get improved determinations of the first root. And the same can be done for the following roots. There is, um, I will write it here, for very weak shocks, the, the infinite series collapses into a unique term, this one here. This vessel function decays like, like r to minus one half divided by one unit, it is minus three halves. Well, this possibility allows us to get information on the weak shock limit about the size of the vortices. And uh, this is what we show next. We have here the zeros of the pressure function as a function of the shock Mach number. So for very weak shocks, they increase like this quantity, which diverges. If the shock becomes weaker, the vortices tend to to become weaker, but to separate from the contact surface. When the shock become, ve become very strong and the level of compression is high, the vortex size reduces to less than one wavelength. It depends on the case. And of course, this is what we see here. For this uh, 5, we had 0.5 for this uh, gamma for this uh, air, shock moving in air. Uh, here, we just plotted the differences between the different, um, the different routes. A very nice result is, is that after the third route, all the routes become equally spaced, like vessel function zeros. So there is a close connection between these functions that represent shock perturbations and vessel functions. Mm, just uh, this is to complete the picture. When the shock runs very far away, it will have left velocity perturbations. I show here the black line is the complete solution. The blue line is the solution far from the piston. And this exponential should be the solution near the piston. This is for normal velocity. And this is for tangential velocity. We have here a shock Mach number equal to three. It is not weak. Then an exclusively approx exponential approximation for the velocity field is wrong. So this can be seen here. 
especially for the tangential velocities. Maybe you can match the normal velocities, but you will be violating mass conservation because of that, because you are, you are not taking into account that actually the velocity field turns geometrically into circles, right? Mm, I need more water. This is the basic question. If the fluid is perturbed in velocity, then it has a content of kinetic energy. Can we calculate it, at least analytically, for some cases? Well, for isolated shock, the answer is, of course, yes. For other boundary conditions, calculations will be more laborious, but it is also true. And in the future, for the classical two fluids, Riefenheim mesh configuration, we hope to do so too. So what we show next is just if we deal with the kinetic energy density in volume, defined well, this is the typical term, multiplied by the density, and integrate along a strip of length lambda over two on the tangential direction and up to infinity to have the whole content of energy in the space, we get this quantity here. This is a dimensionless integral. This dimensionless integral Compute this analytically from this expression, I would say it is impossible. Then it must be transformed by, with the fluid equations, and we get this very nice result. It can also be said, this looks as horrible as this integral here, but everything what we have developed before helps to get the analytical expression of this last integral. And this is... Uh, how to say, uh, our last observation. What I plot to the left is the shock pressure time perturbation history at the shock front as it moves. So here is distance travels by the shock divided by lambda. These times here are the times of local maxima and local minima and the times of zero crossing, which coincide with the times of um, complete vortex structure generation. And I plotted here the time evolution of this kinetic energy density as a function of time in space following the shock. So tau, tau A here corresponds to this first maximum, or no, local minimum, actually, of the pressure perturbation. Tau B corresponds to the first zero crossing when the shock creates the first vertical structure. And we see this uh, picture here. While the shock is near, velocities are still changing because of the pressure waves. They do not reach the asymptotic. But when the shock is very far, this kinetic energy density in space will resemble the red thick curve here. And a nice surprise. If we plot this asymptotic kinetic energy as a function of Mach number, we see that for very weak shocks, the contribution is a sudden exponential because in that limit, impulsive model is okay, and then with the exponential is more than enough. But as shock strength increases, I find this uh, really, well, really tempting to continue studying. If you look, the local maxima and the local minima as a function of the Mach number, they tend to coincide in space. And uh, a substructure is being created in the fluid in which kinetic energy is being, how to say, I would not say stratified, but concentrated in spots of intense motion. Yes? I don't remember the next. Uh, yes. My time, is, my time is running. So the natural question after we have seen this is, could we predict analytically the position of this maxima and minima? The answer is yes. It can be predicted. And I will not explain all the calculations. It consists just in taking the derivative of the kinetic energy, making it equal to zero. And we arrive after using incompressibility and vorticity generation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, I, will, I will show here. This first minimum corresponds with the zeros of the asymptotic tangential velocity. It looks strange, but it is that. And the maxima correspond to the zeros of this function here. This is normal velocity, and this is proportional to the vorticity field. So the vorticity field always is behind, and uh, 
um, how to say, influencing the state of affairs after the shock has uh, disappeared from the scenery. Just here, this is uh, to complete the calculations. The, the integral that defines this kinetic energy can be analytically calculated, so um, we do not need to wait for Mathematica to do these uh, complicated integrals. And this he, he, the picture is as a function of gamma, for different gammas as a function of the shock Mach number. There are some asymptotic scalings. scalings. There is an evol evolved, is, do you understand? A curve that is uh, an envelope. Yes, so the red curve here to gamma equal to one is the envelope of all the curves. So it will be the maximum kinetic energy that can be extracted from these uh, corrugated shocks inside a single fluid. Just uh, to mention, the exact um, solutions are several pages long. So it is no sense to write them by hand. But the different physical limits can be extracted very nicely. And this uh, well, weak shock limit, it starts growing like the intensity squared. And later, we have strange powers here due to the vorticity field. Strong shock limit, it grows logarithmically. Uh, with uh, No, this is, yes, there should be, maybe I, I, I put the wrong <laughs> slide, I'm sorry. Uh, this is to show just that different limits can be uh, extracted, of course, with some work, but not so terrible. We did the same for the free surface. And for the free surface, results are even nicer. So uh, free surface means that at the surface where the shock started to move, pressure perturbations are obliged to be zero, like the surface of the sea. This is a typical approximation. And then we see here velocity, tangential, ve uh, normal velocity, tangential velocity for different times following the shock. And maxima and minima, maxima and minima, uh, agree quite neatly with the maxima, minima, and zero crossing of the shock pressure history. So if we plot the kinetic energy density as a function of time, we still preserve the same correlation between these times and the times at the, at the shock uh, time evolution. Just, uh, I am going to finish. This has nothing to do with uh, kinetic energy, but this is a nice result. Uh, if we plot at the free surface ripple, the ripple amplitude as a function of time, so its velocity will asymptotize in time quite rapidly. And its ripple amplitude will do the following that we have also observed in two fluids, either in simulations or in experiments. This is uh, red line is the amplitude of the piston ripple, piston corrugation as a function of time. The dotted line is it the asymptotic. The asymptotic here has obviously velocity multiplied by time, but this ordinate here is not the initial post-shock amplitude, but rather a lower value. So the initial post-shock amplitude should be the point at which the red curve starts. But because of compressibility, and you want to say, if you would like, because of vorticity, this is a matter of taste for the language. Actually, because of the compressibility of the problem, the, at large times, it seems as if the system started from a lower amplitude, not size zero asterisk or start. And the nice point, and this repeats at any, almost at any experiment we have seen or simulation. The time at which the asymptotic crosses for the first time the complete solution here coincides very neatly with the time when the shock uh, reaches his first maximum. So the shock has not yet formed the complete vorticity field. And the interface knows what will be the value of the asymptotic velocity. So this is, uh, sounds strange, but it leaves open an interesting question. If this is so, and this is confirmed by many calculations, this may mean that the asymptotic velocity, to calculate it, we need the whole time pressure history. Perhaps with much less information, it could be calculated in the future. And uh, I think I, have, I am out of time. <laughs> uh, I cannot uh, just, well, it's not.
conclusions, which are more or less the same things I have been saying up to now. Thank you very much, and uh, open questions.